My presentation today will be key system power supplies and power supplies that can be used on a various type of 55X type switchboards. There are a series of 55X switchboards that are called standalone boards. They do not require any auxiliary equipment to make them work because they were the PBX board. Uh, a 556, I believe, is a 701 a console. A 552 would be a standalone, and so forth. Those PBX boards require a 24 volt power supply as well as a ringing generator, which is typically 105 volts AC, non superimposed ringing. This power supply, I will show the fuses and discuss the taps and so forth. These are just common universal power supplies. There were different physical styles uh, made depending on the application that they were used for. The companies such as ITT, Stromberg Carlson, Automatic Electric, Northern Electric, that had key systems, had power supplies that performed the same function. However, they had a different cosmetic appearance, but they all worked the same way. I will remove the cover here off of this power unit that I have on my workbench and we'll show you some of the taps, the fuses, and discuss a little bit about the power unit itself. I do not intend for this video to be a technical presentation on how to connect it up to all of the various types of technology. I will just explain what the units do. I will briefly cover some of the terminal strips that you find in the 551 series key systems and what the, the uh, labels mean. Um, to help a person better understand this because the terminology is pretty much the same throughout the different manufacturers of equipment <clears throat> and the different types of equipment. As I stated before, these power supplies are common. This one's a Western Electric, but Lorraine made power supplies like this. Elgin Electronics made them. ITT made a more modern power supply later on in their life, as well as Northern Electric had their own power supply. I don't believe Automatic Electric ever made their own power supplies for key systems. I believe they always used Lorraine's or Elgin's. And there were a couple other manufacturers that was, uh, made power systems, but not necessarily used by the three major equipment manufacturers. So, when you're dealing with a 1A1 or 1A2, or depending on the 55X type switchboard, this would be one of the choices used. This particular power supply would not have been used with a 551A or B or C because they had their own 28 type power supply that did the same exact thing, minus the ringing generator, and they had smaller output. This is a fairly beefy power supply for running, you know, a pretty nice load of phones, switchboards, auxiliary equipment. At the very bottom here, under the plastic cover, I would discuss those terminal shortly. Down here are what's called the grounds. Now they have here 18 volt, 10 volt, 10 volt signal and talk. Under these screws, they're all tied together and then they're tied to this big screw, which is a common ground screw. Also, most of the Western Electric power supplies had the ringing generator ground also strapped to the common ground 
bus so that way the ringing generator which is producing an ac signal is now referenced to ground and that is very important on key systems and pbx switchboards for things to operate correctly there has been cases where these power supplies were not tied together and that was a floating output uh, Lorraine and I, uh, Elgin, I believe, you had to actually put the strap in in order to make it reference to ground. Um, and I think the 101 series may have also needed reference to ground. I do not intend on trying to cover every power supply ever made because A, I don't have all of them, and B, I'm sure there's things out there I've never saw before. And depending on what they were used for, there could be some variations. However, there is a documentation available for almost all of these power systems. There's nothing secret about it. Um, they were thousands of them made for lots of different applications within the telecommunications world. So this one has an 18 volt AC tap. Your 551 A, B, and C also has an 18 volt tap, has a 10 volt talk battery and signal however they're the same this one here the talk battery is filtered there's a capacitor resistor inside of the unit so that provides what's called talking battery this is this 24 volt dc signal battery for control and relays the talk battery is what's used for the intercoms or in the case of a 55x switchboard the uh, talking battery that would be supplied to the telephone sets as well as the operator telephone. Your, some of these power supplies made by different companies and different models made by Western Electric would have the A talk and the B signal, but they were the same circuit underneath. They would just strap them together because they did not, it was all filtered. So you may have something that says signal battery, but it was really talk battery. But in order to keep the tourists happy, they marked it uh, signal. Then you have 10 volts AC. Typically the 10 volts AC is used to operate an interrupter or the lamps. The 18 volts can be used to operate auxiliary uh, buzzers if they're AC buzzers or the AC-DC type buzzers. Um, also, there was uh, 107 loudspeakers and other things like that that could use 18 volts. So a lot of your power supplies had that and generally it was not in small installations used that often, but it's there. I have a voltmeter that I will show the voltages Keep in mind that this power supply is not um, made to the tolerances of like computer, PC computer power supplies. When it says 10 volts AC, you might find, depending on the load, the power supply, line voltage, and a lot of factors, it could be nine and a half volts up to 12 and a half volts. When they talk about the 10 volts, that's just kind of a center frequent or center um, voltage. The same thing in the 18 volts. You can see them go up to 20 volts or down to 17. Again, does not matter. The signal and the talk, again, can be anywhere from as low as 18 volts up to as high as 26, 27 volts. Again, your intercoms, uh, like Melco's, Tone Commanders, Valcoms, and so forth, they're just happy with that. They have a wide tolerance on the input. Uh, if it says it's a 24-volt supply, do not put 48 volts into it, otherwise you'll have smoke. But if it says it's 24 volts and you put in 28 volts, you're not going to do any damage to the unit. Depending on what the application is, you really have to ground the common ground to an actual earth ground if you're using traditional TDM type telephone service, uh, telco service, and depending on the line card in a 551 KSU or any of the KSUs, they may 
need that as a reference to ground because some of the old stuff was designed to go from the ringside to telephone line to the power supply ground. You remove the power supply ground, you'd lose your ringing from the phone company because the equipment would not have a return path. That was very common in 1A and 1A1 type systems and 1A2 depending on the 400 series KTU that you were using. Also the same would be on the 55X type switchboards. In your typical landline telephone, the, as I just stated, they would send ringing generator down the ring side the line and a lot of these systems wanted to see an earth ground. If you're doing VOIP on a 1A2 system, you need an issue 15 or other manufacturer's line cards that has the ringing looking at the tip side of the line. So it's a return path on the tip side of the line. And that's a different video down the road. One of the things that this power supply internally is set up as the positive terminal of the capacitor and the transformer are tied to ground. So this is what's called a positive ground system. And that's very important to understand that. Your automotive industry and your normal, I would say, electronics industry did not do positive ground. There is a reason for it, and it is so technically involved that I am not going to get in, into that. Um, that is an entire multi-long hour video to describe the reason they did that. And that information is available on the web. So if you take your voltmeter and you go from here to one of these terminals as long as you take and put the black lead of your voltmeter to ground and I will show this in a moment here and then you set your voltmeter of course in this case to read DC and I will set it on here and I will get a negative 24 volts. So let me get the meter up where you can see it. Oh, that doesn't work either. So, sorry about this, people. Okay. Oh, there we go. So you'll see that we have 24 volts. That's odd. Should be higher than that, but that's fine. I'll go up here, and again, we got 24 volts. It's the same tap on the transformer. It just one goes through a resistor capacitor, and the other one goes direct. I will measure the AC power output, and this here gives us 10.2. This one should be the same because they're strapped underneath. And then this should be 18 jolts, and it is. And then if I get down here below, and I have removed the screw to show this, and here is the 130 volts under no load. The Two wires here come from the ringing generator. The red wires is the AC line up from the power cord. You always want to have that covered. And as with all electrical equipment, the nut jobs are scared to death that somebody might touch something, so they have a warning. Whatever you do, don't touch anything in your life or you may get shocked. I've given you the warning. Um, you can, depending on your line voltage from the power company, change the tap. Well, I've been at this for 40 years. I've never changed the tap. I haven't had to. They're usually set at 117. If you were extreme distance under incredible load or running on a generator and the power was a little bit different, you might need to change the tap. Just know you can, but no need to. As it is right now, this power supply is not grounded to the world. So if I was to take my voltmeter and connect it to an actual earth ground and touch any of these, I will have nothing. So I would have to ground it. There was a time that they did actually take the power supply 
this unit or the other types and connect it to the green ground wire, the power cord, which is not technically correct to do that. In here, you have fuses. And the fuses, in this case, you're gonna have reds, oranges, greens, blues, and whites and so forth, depending on the power supply and the amp for each of it. These are what's called a 24 type fuse. A 24 type fuse, as long as well as uh, grasshopper fuses, which were 30 type and then 70 type fuses, were made specifically for the telephone industry. You're not going to find these fuses anywhere other than somewhere that sold uh, key system components. Graybar Electric used to carry the 24 type fuses and there's 24A, B, C, and so forth. And the numbers are a designation of the amperage. So um, there was probably 20 different amperages of fuses and I won't get into those details other than this is a 24 type fuse. Now, you can, if you have a outboard automotive fuse holder and you can't find a fuse, you can take and put um, spades on the end of a, a regular fuse holder and put it in there and then put in an ACG type fuse and that'll work fine. It'll look stupid, but it'll work perfectly fine. Do not ever strap out the fuse. Once you do that, you've removed 100% of protection from a short, and that's when things will start to smoke, either the power supply or whatever you're connecting it to. So it's the same for the 18 volts, the 10 volts, and the 24 volts, or any voltage for that matter. These power supplies can fail the Western Electric ones failing is like probably dot zero 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 forty five minutes later zero one percent. The other manufacturers, I've seen thousands of power supplies in my lifetime, and maybe I've had two or three that ever actually went bad. The exception was the ITT K six zero one A key system power supply. That was a solid state power supply that. Um, did not age well. Uh, and even when they were brand new out of the box, they didn't age well. Uh, so those, if they go bad, you either have a, someone who understands PC board uh, technology repair to put in new triacs on them and, or transistors, depends on what went bad. And uh, they had various issues, uh, numbers where they had re different uh, designs. So anyway, this covers kind of the power supply. So I have a standard telephone ringer and I will connect that up momentarily to the output. You can ring a standard telephone ringer without a capacitor. And if you live in Idaho, they probably call them capacitators, but you can make the ringer work without a capacitor and it'll work fine. It'll sound different and uh, it loads down the ringing generator a little bit more, but it worked just fine. And they did that with diode ringing um, on key systems. And that's a different video all by itself. And I do have a video of on diode ringing. These power supplies, like I said, are pretty much bulletproof. So um, the, they have a grommet at the bottom. You run your wire up through here and then you tie it down to the screws. Um, if you look at the Bell System Practices, and I do want to mention a thing about the Bell System Practices. The Bell System set the standard for the telephone industry because it was AT&T Bell Labs and the Bell System followed it and the rest of the industry generally followed what AT&T had put out. Generally, if you're running a surface wire, and I would use a Cat5 uh, for this sake of conversation, even though I hate Cat5 cable, and 6 and 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 100, you would take the white wires out of your Cat5 cable, and those are the tip 
leads. So if you look at the color code, white is the tip, blue is the ring, white of the orange, and then orange is the ring, white, green, the white is the tip, and so forth. And it follows the entire color code all the way down to the violet slate pair, which would be the 25th pair. Generally, not 100% exclusively, but generally, you always use the tip side of the color of wire for ground, and then you use the ring side of the colors, the blue, orange, green, brown, slate, as your source to whatever you're connecting it to. If you follow that pattern all of the way through, then when you look at a pair of wires, you'll know what is ground and what is battery. In the telephone industry, and only the telephone industry, they refer, referred to the DC component or even the AC component as battery. <clears throat> there is a reason for that, because when you go back to the 1800s, they didn't have commercial power and everything ran on batteries. So a lot of your documentation was talk battery, signal battery, control battery, and so forth. So if you're looking at a schematic, such as a 551, and I will show that in a moment, uh, it'll have terminals marked AB and BB. That's A battery and B battery. And then you'll have AG and BG, A ground and B ground. You'll have LG, which is lamp ground. <clears throat> then you will have RG uh, for ring ground and RC for ring common or RB, depending on who made it and what they were trying to get across. It's not hard to comprehend this stuff. It's just if you're not used to working with telephony type equipment, that can kind of confuse people because the documents was all designed around people who had training. Nothing in this world like this stuff is rocket science by any means. But if you don't know the terminology, it might as well be rocket science. So you will see documentation that's labeled A, B, 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 and so forth. Um, and that will be common with uh, Western, ITT, Kellogg, Stromberg, Carlson, Automatic Electric, and so forth. Um, and a lot of the outboard equipment that was made, such as Valcom, Tone Commander, Teletone, and so forth, they would have on their intercoms and their equipment A battery, B battery, signal battery, and so forth. So those are all meaningful terms. Um, they don't spell it out that easily on the power supplies, but it is there. Okay, I have my C4 ringer, and what I'm going to do is just ring the bell. So again, I've got hot 120 line voltage from the power company here, and then this is the output of the ringing generator, and they're just connected below to the screws down here. So that is the ringer with the capacitor in there. I'm not going to strap the ring capacitor out in this case for demonstration, but there is a slight difference in sound. As you've noticed, I can hook this the the ground lead anywhere I want assuming that my radio shock lead will be cooperative because this ground is tied to those all the way across a good test if you have a power supply and you're not sure if the ringing generator is connected to ground if you hook up to any of these ground terminals and you go on the ringer output and you get nothing then you can move the lead to the ringer ground, ringing generator ground, and that would tell you if it was floating or if it was uh, reference to ground. The odds of having a defective ringing generator is so ridiculously low. I've had maybe two or three ringing generators in my lifetime that's failed. They just work. There's not much to them to fail, so that's why they work. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind, depending on the phone system you're working on, if you're connecting up, we'll say a 1A2 system that's got a fair amount of phones, let's say 10, 15 phones or so, you want to use a 22 gauge or a 20 um, gauge wire between this and your equipment. 
If you use connecting this up for a 550X type switchboard, you can use, again, 22 is the recommended gauge. If you use 24 gauge and it's just a hobby thing, it'll work perfectly fine. As disgusting as it may sound, you can use a Cat5 cable. Just please don't use the blue ones. <laughs> use gray. Anyway, um, to run off to your auxiliary equipment. So, I will show some of the various package of power supplies uh, later on in this video. Uh, if these fuses do go out, they do come up on eBay occasionally. They are hard to find. I'm not going to tell you they're not. Um, you know, at one time, everybody had a, a mountain of them in their truck, and then after the breakup, they all got thrown away. And even though I have a lot of resources for uh, surplus phone stuff, I'm even having a difficult time finding them. So one thing, if you have a system that's got a problem, you can, and I recommend you do this very, very carefully. If you're blowing a fuse, you can take the fuse out, take a 10 volt lamp or a 24 volt lamp, depending on what you're trying to do, and put it across those terminals and if the light bulb lights up it tells you you got a short then you can start working and trying to find your short once you relieved the short wherever it was at the light will go out which means now if you put a new fuse in you will not blow the fuse that's kind of for skilled people and i don't recommend doing that uh, if you're not comfortable with working with electrical equipment the serious side of things is other than the AC power going in here, this power supply cannot hurt you. Yeah, you'll get shocked if you're wet, grounded, or whatever. And yes, you can die with a few millivolts in the right place in your body. So a 9-volt DC battery could kill you too. So don't let the fear of this being an electrical item overcome you. Just understand that you can get shocked. You can blow fuses. You can create a problem. If you get on the AC part, this ringing generator, it'll kick your ass. I'll tell you that right now. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, so you need to be a little careful in that. Um, these, as I've stated before, these are pretty simple, pretty straightforward units. And I will show a 551 power supply and a couple others that I have use on my system just to give you an idea of the different packages that were available. I don't have many of the non-Bell system power supplies. Uh, mostly everything I have is Western Electric, but if I find any, I'll throw them here on the video shortly. 551C KSU power supply. This unit does not have a ringing generator built in. Here is a larger, I believe, I don't know what the model number of this is. Maybe it's a 28 power supply. And this has got a lot of output horsepower. This is designed to run a lot of auxiliary equipment. And it does have a ringing generator. Uh, and one of them has a ring generator. The other one was not equipped with it. And I don't need that for my particular application because I only need one ringing generator. Here is a 90 type power supply for the 620 series 1A2 panels. It's the same unit as the ones I just showed down below with a different mounting frame and it has uh, connectors on the bottom of it so you can plug things into it. it. Does the same exact thing. It has an interrupter built into it to run the panels. That is a Northern Electric power supply the unit over on the left side is their ringing generator. This is an Elgin power supply. Stromberg and ITT used a lot of these. This is a very good power supply. It uses ACG type fuses that are the same as the automotive. This is a quick picture of a Stromberg 501 type KSU and their power supply. They look like that in real life. I don't know if they ever really changed the design or not. As I previously threatened um, to show you how they did the labeling in a KSU, here we go. 
So you see at the bottom it has RB, it's ring battery, ring ground, ring battery, ring ground. And then you have ground B, BA, which is um, battery A, which is the uh, talk. And then battery B, ground battery, 10 volts, plus or minus 10 volt ground. On the AC, if it has a plus over a minus, that's telling you it's alternating current and so forth. There's no 18 volts used on this system at this little point right here. Now, the 18 volts could be used as a substitute for the ring ground ring battery if you're using buzzers. Uh, and if you do not have a ringing generator, that was one option. Most of the buzzers work perfectly fine on 10 volts AC if they're using the little buzzers, um, such as these types of buzzers right here. They work on 10 volts or 18, and they only work on AC. They will not work on DC current. One of the wiring diagrams for an ITT key system where they've only shown the RB, BB, and BG. They are nice enough to put under it 24 volts, 105, and 10 volts AC. But you may just see the terminology without the voltages. Here's a quick schematic of the ITT 601 power supply. Here's a schematic drawing showing what a fuse looks like in a schematic. In that case, it's fuse F2 and it's a two amp fuse. I'm showing this over here is the terminals wiring in on a 584C panel of the different power that would be used. They're showing an interrupter and then the common leads for the power input to the 584. This is what typical telephone wiring drawings look like. They show the fuse, they tell you what the amperage should be in most cases and what the voltage should be. This is the last power supply that ITT made for their 1A2 systems. These were pretty good power supplies. They were much smaller and they were designed for their 1A2 systems. And you can see the picture, they look kind of like that in real life. Here is a 118 frequency ringing generator used in a Western Electric 551B or 551C key telephone unit. These can be used for uh, workbench test supplies to provide ringing to a telephone. These provide 30 hertz ringing and the power supplies I showed you in this video were all 30 hertz power supplies. Uh, or 30 hertz ringing, I should say. They did have an early generation that was a 101A that provided actual 20 hertz. This unit, because it's only got two terminals, it's 105 to 110 volts AC output. If you needed to do superimposing for some reason, and I don't recommend trying that unless you know exactly what you're doing because you will burn stuff up very easily if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish because it's floating which means you can insert, insert a different voltage in one terminal and you'll get two different voltages out of this um, and that's used for central office and big pbx system type ringing sources. So there will be a reference in some documents to um, superimposed ringing versus regular ringing. So depending on what you're reading, there is a difference. Um, superimposed ringing is not anything that you should ever in your lifetime come across the need to deal with. I hope this provides some detail on power systems. Um, Again, find the correct document for your unit and you should be just fine. And remember, enjoy yourself if you're making a hobby phone system or whatever. Thanks and have a great day. If you would, please subscribe and like. Here is some 1A1 and some 584C panels with 400 type KTUs. These are all connected to the bottom two power supplies.